I am Rear Admiral Hanlon. And as commander of Joint Task Force 7, I should like to present this brief film report on the highlights of Operation Red Wing. I want to point out to those of you who might have a deeper interest, not fulfilled by this report, that there are available more detailed reports, such as Commander Joint Task Force 7, final report on Operation Red Wing, the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project, technical films, written reports, and short technical films produced by the task force overseas. My chief of staff and deputies will assist in this presentation. Red Wing, the sixth series of nuclear tests conducted in the Pacific Proving Ground, was nearly three times the magnitude of that of any previous one. The purpose of Red Wing was twofold. To test 17 experimental weapons and devices, to conduct some 43 weapons effects tests and diagnostic measurements associated with the 17 shots. The cost of Red Wing was on the order of $160 million and did not include the cost of nuclear materials or the design and production of the devices. Some $120 million went for the cost of participation by the Army, Navy, Air Force, Joint Task Force 7, Armed Forces Special Weapon Project, and the Atomic Energy Commission. The remainder was experimental expenses, which included approximately 24 million, covering the expendable scientific construction. This is the price paid for testing operations necessary for the advancement of nuclear weapons and conducted in a remote area of the Pacific to provide the ultimate in safety factors. Obviously, an operation of the magnitude of Red Wing requires a great deal of support in terms of people, aircraft, ships, and money. A complex but extremely flexible command organization and an elaborate communication network. Organizationally, Red Wing carried a typical Joint Task Force staff of about 170 people divided about equally among the three services. The command was organized into five task groups. Task Group 7.1, Task Group 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, and 7.5. 7.1 consisted of about 1,200 scientific and military personnel and were concerned with positioning, arming, and detonating all weapons and devices. It also conducted weapons effects tests and diagnostic measurement programs. 7.2, about 1,200 Army personnel provided ground security, operated communications, provided certain logistic support, including 550 vehicles of all types, and some $1.5 million worth of signal equipment. The Navy Task Group 7.3, with some 22 ships, 31 small craft, 37 aircraft, and approximately 6,000 personnel, provided security and safety patrols in the danger area. Service ship transportation between the Pacific Proving Ground and the zone of the interior. A small boat and helicopter transport at Bikini Atoll. Shipboard command and communication facilities and support of numerous scientific projects. The Air Force Task Group 7.4, with some 2,300 personnel and about 130 aircraft, exercised air control and directed operation of all test and support aircraft, was responsible for search and rescue functions, provided weather service and air transport at Anuitak Atoll and between Bikini and Anuitak Atolls. Task Group 7.5, with about 2,000 civilian personnel, provided base logistic support, built structures for effects and diagnostic measurement programs, and operated a boat pool at Anuitak Atoll. We planned Red Wing so as to utilize the two atoll concept, that is, large hard shots were fired at Bikini, and the small, relatively easy ones at the Anuitak Atoll. Actually, on two occasions, shots were fired nearly simultaneously at both atolls. This was an innovation unique to Red Wing. From the very beginning, 
great emphasis was placed on the safety of the personnel in the Pacific Proving Ground, natives of the Marshall Islands, shipping and air traffic. For the latter part of Castle and for Red Wing, the danger area was increased to about 400,000 square miles to afford adequate protection. The smaller area was the air control area. A continuous search of the large area was conducted by a squadron of Navy patrol aircraft. Better weather information and therefore more reliable forecasting was realized through a weather central staffed with highly qualified personnel from all services. The acquiring of a new type of weather balloon operable above 90,000 feet, development of the WASP high altitude weather sounding missile, effective to altitudes of about 100,000 feet and launched from destroyer weather ships, and construction of four weather stations by the task force to augment the existing Pacific Area Weather Service. In the RAD safe area, we had an effective fallout prediction unit in headquarters. Another innovation was equipping of this unit with fallout computers, recently developed by the National Bureau of Standards and the Sandia Corporation. 17 RAD safe monitoring stations were located throughout the Pacific area to provide further protection. In the interest of fish life protection, marine radiological surveys were made of large areas in Pacific Proving Ground and vicinity by Navy ships using scientific personnel of the Atomic Energy Commission, Division of Biology and Medicine. This was done first about the middle of the operation and again after the operation terminated. The Scripps Institute conducted continuous oceanographic analyses of fallout areas. I should like to digress for a moment to comment on the official observer program sponsored by the Atomic Energy Commission and the Department of Defense. During Red Wing, we had six separate groups of responsible military and civilian officials. And in addition, large numbers of technical observers visited the Pacific Proving Grounds. As a result, the military representatives and high government officials obtained an understanding of the business which should be of great value to them and their parent organizations. Our special interest was the press and federal civil defense agency observer groups. The press group, consisted of some 15 media representatives from the field of television, radio, newspapers, magazines, and periodicals. A like number from the Federal Civil Defense Agency from all over the country witnessed the shots. These groups witnessed the Cherokee airdrop, which was declared an open shot for this purpose. Due to weather delays postponing Cherokee for 18 days, the group was able to witness the lacrosse shot also declared an open shot for Red Wing. Judging from reports and comments, it would appear that the press visit resulted in a substantial contribution to public relations for the military services and the Atomic Energy Commission. It is felt that these programs were justified. At this point, I should like to ask Dr. Ogle, my scientific director, to provide a resume of the weapons development highlights on Red Wing. Dr. Ogle. Castle, in 1954, gave us thermonuclear devices that could be carried only in our largest planes. We needed weapons now that could be carried externally on fighter aircraft or that could be dropped by light and medium bombers. And we needed small diameter, lightweight thermonuclear weapons for use in conjunction with the missiles being developed by the armed forces. Thus, a major part of the development effort of the two weapons laboratories Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory and University of California Radiation Laboratory at Livermore, for the year and a half preceding Red Wing, went into the design of smaller and lighter thermonuclear devices. In addition, we made strenuous efforts to reduce the size and weight of our fission weapons, perhaps at the expense of efficiency, to meet present and future requirements of small missiles, artillery, and ground-to-air missiles. Code name, La Crosse, 39 kilotons. Code name, Cherokee, 3.8 megatons.
Osage, 1.7 kilotons. Erie, 15 and a half kilotons. Seminole, 13 kilotons. Flathead, 375 kilotons. Dakota, 1.1 megatons. Apache, 1.9 megatons. Huron, 270 kilotons. Mohawk, 350 kilotons. The main contribution of activity to fall out from such devices comes from the radioactive fragments produced by that fission. Such fallout may seriously contaminate the region close to a detonation. It may injure or kill people several hundred miles from the point of detonation, Four point seven megatons. Tiwa, five megatons. It is clear from a weapons development viewpoint that Operation Red Wing was an outstanding success. The key areas of Army interest were static and dynamic pressures produced by detonations of various yields and especially study of the long positive phase resulting from both air and ground bursts in the megaton range. We collected data also on the rapid determination of fallout. Here we are interested because of the proximity of friendly installations to targets on the atomic battlefield. Such data is, incidentally, completely dependent upon timely and accurate weather information. To protect our stockpile of tactical atomic warheads, as well as to impair or destroy the enemies, the Army required knowledge of the vulnerability of nuclear weapons. One other key factor in our support of atomic strikes is definite knowledge of the yield and ground zero of our weapons. Red Wing experiments dealing with the detection, location, and analysis of atomic bursts were successful. This will lead to the development of portable, self-contained instruments capable of continuous surveillance of the atomic battlefield. 
The results of Red Wing were of considerable interest and benefit to the Navy. An outstanding feature was the increased yields obtainable from devices of greatly decreased sizes and weights. Such factors will permit diversification of delivery systems in aircraft and ships. Our first line carrier aircraft, the A3D or Sky Warrior, was exposed to blast and thermal effects from megaton yield weapons. It was also positioned to simulate a drop aircraft. And these tests indicated that the A3D can deliver megaton weapons with a good escape probability. In the field of atomic defense, progress was also made. All ships of the Navy task group were equipped with washdown systems which proved to be most effective. Preliminary data gathered from specially configured remote control ships in the fallout area provided additional information regarding decontamination procedures in general. Data to determine the relative radiation dosages from the air, water, and the ship's weather surfaces was also collected. This knowledge provides additional criteria in the development of ship's shielding. Also, experiments with types of protective coating were conducted on ships and certain test aircraft. Spraying of a paint-like substance on exposed surfaces added a high degree of protection against contamination. The results of these experiments will assist us in the determination of naval operations in heavy fallout areas, as well as provide valuable data for the design of naval vessels of the future. The Navy is also interested in the many aspects of the various weapons effect tests as they pertain to aircraft, which will be discussed by General Griffith. Throughout the operation, the necessity for fast and accurate weather predictions was demonstrated. The Navy will benefit from the development of the WASP, a high altitude wind sounding rocket and by the increase of altitude of weather balloons. These two developments will provide faster and more accurate weather data from altitudes of 60,000 to 100,000 feet. In addition, the regular Navy window shells prove most valuable for soundings up to 34,000 feet. All this will lead to an increased effectiveness of fleet operations in the conduct of atomic warfare. In conclusion, the 6,000 naval personnel gain valuable experience as they are much better prepared to cope with the many aspects of atomic warfare and will form a nucleus to instruct other naval personnel. The scope of Air Force operations in Red Wing precludes a discussion of the results of each program in which we had a vital interest. In view of this, I have selected and shall briefly summarize only two which I consider most pertinent to this presentation, the Aircraft Effect Program and the Early Penetration Project. The Aircraft Effects Program was designed to test the structural responses of operational type aircraft to the blast and thermal loads experienced in the vicinity of nuclear or thermonuclear detonations. The particular Air Force aircraft tested during the wing were the B-52, the B-47, the B-66, the B-57, the F-84F, and the F-101. These aircraft were positioned to receive the type loads they would experience during weapon delivery. In general, they were flown directly over ground zero at a time shortly before, at, or after the burst time to receive the desired effects. While the objective of such studies was the collection of scientific data, the safety of air crews was a consideration of primary importance in the conduct of Red Wing aircraft tests. Elaborate precautions were taken to ensure that the aircraft would be in the right place at the right time. 
The preliminary data acquired by the effects aircraft indicate excellent results. In addition to giving us safety parameters for existing aircraft, the data should be of great value in design of future aircraft. The early penetration project was included to investigate the feasibility of aircraft penetrating clouds from high yield weapons at times shortly after a burst. Five B-57s and 21 pilots from the Tactical Air Command were assigned for the project. The B-57B was chosen due to its high altitude capabilities and the 21 pilots were required to ensure that sufficient data could be accumulated without subjecting any individual to excessive doses of radiation. It was determined that such cloud penetrations would have to be made so early that the conservative operational radiation dosage limit of 3.9 Rentgen would have to be exceeded in individual penetrations. Task Force 7 received approval for a dosage of 50 Rentgens for the 21 pilots. Mission planning, however, assured that no pilot would receive over 25 Rentgens and in a great many penetrations, no dosages over 10 Rentgens were recorded. During the operation, there were two drops by aircraft. This was a free fall drop of a thermonuclear weapon by a B-52 flying at 40,000 feet. It was set to burst at 5,000 feet, but actually burst at 4,300 feet with a yield of 3.5 megatons. The bomb did not have a good CEP because of personnel error. This caused some loss of data. Most significant, however, is the fact that we satisfactorily proof-tested the delivery capability of a thermonuclear weapon with a B-52. It can be predicted that high-performance operational type aircraft can fly through the cloud from any weapon, the design of which we know, at an altitude of 45,000 feet or less. At any time later than 10 minutes after detonation, and the pilot will probably receive no more than 75 Rentgen's total dosage. Thank you, General Griffith. Admiral Sutherland, will you please summarize the operation at this time? Technically, operationally, and militarily, Red Wing may be summarized in one word, success. This operation marks a most significant step forward in the research and development of fission and fusion weapons. These successful tests will lead to the development of a variety of weapons calculated to meet a wide range of military usage, including defense against air attack. This variety of weapons will permit diversification of delivery systems of all kinds, that is, aircraft, missiles, gun-fired projectiles, demolitions, and depth charges. The emphasis on safety, safety of task force personnel, of the Marshallese population, of transit aircraft and shipping paid off 100%. Most important in the safety program was the ability to predict and hence predetermine radioactive fallout. The key to this was greatly improved weather forecasting stemming from increased knowledge of tropical meteorology. In carrying out the Red Wing test series to its successful conclusion, one factor, a most gratifying factor, is quite evident. The three military services a large group of scientists, technicians, and contractor personnel worked and lived together for many months in the Central Pacific, far from home and under trying conditions to get a job done. This job was accomplished and the many benefits are already being put to practical use. This concludes Admiral Hanlon's film report of Operation Red Wing.